Hold me, me one second. Keep on Facebook and get YouTube going. Ah. All right. All right. <laughs> uh, welcome back, everybody. I took the last couple Fridays off. I had family vacation, whatnot. And I am running behind today, too. I don't even... I, computer was off. I could get my references set up. So um, I put in the video description that I would be talking about basic assumptions. Hold on a second. I'm going to turn my air conditioning off. It's making a lot of noise. And everything in the way. All right. Um, yeah, basic assumptions. Uh, I guess I had to put something like, what am I going to talk about? What not? So I'm working on the same painting I worked on last time. Um, I've been calling this painting totally under control. <laughs> it's kind of funny to me. All right, so, um, yeah, basic assumptions, what are they? Um, sorry, I'm still scattered here. I'm just putting it together. Now I'm behind. I've, I also uh, have moved uh, my personal self into a different place, so I've been busy moving stuff and so this is actually the first time I've been sitting down to paint in a in a while. So this is good to force me back into my production mode. Um, so I've had some time to think about stuff and and uh, you know thinking about the journey as an artist and whatnot, or you know you can apply this to any journey, I suppose. But um, you're kind of Everybody's dealt a hand, you know, like when you're, wherever you're born, whatever you're born into, you're dealt a hand. Um, and th th that hand is what I mean by the basic assumption. So um, the things that you're, the frame of mind that you're raised in often is related to the social economic class you're born into, you know, race, gender, all, all those things. And the basic assumptions that we have are usually things that we take for granted or just, you know, we assume them without ever even realizing what they are. Um, I guess the, like, a good example of that would be, like, most of us in the, in the U.S. don't wonder where our water is coming from or if it's safe to drink out of the faucet and those sort of things. We have these sort of just obvious things that work, and they don't work out of nothing. They were created and engineered and, and designed and rules and regulations were put in place so that you could have running water coming out of your sink that you could depend on and you didn't have to spend a good portion of your day going and hunting for water that, to drink. You know, like one of the basic fundamentals of survival. Or, And for that matter, most of us have, you know, the assumptions that food isn't going to, we're not going to be starving for a week. Um, we were born into, if you're in the U.S., born into a very rich country, even if you were born into the poverty side of the U.S., um, you're richer than most of the world. And I, I, I get that there's, you know, a lot of people in the U.S. that are suffering and food and hungry and, and uh, need food. And that's for some, I'm not saying that that doesn't happen. But uh, I'm talking about, you know, in general terms. Um Anyways, it's not to make a, it's not to like harp on that point. The, the point is, is that we have assumptions and, and the, some of those assumptions are real basic like that. And other assumptions are cultural. Um, and so like to kind of get around to the point, I guess, the one of the assumptions I was raised with was, um, well, not really assumptions. The, the mentality I was raised with was um, to fix, to do everything yourself so to speak, like, if things break, you fix them, you know, you, you don't buy new stuff. Uh, my dad has had the same vacuum cleaner since 1980. You know, he, whenever it breaks, he fixes it. And so that, that was something I think I'd inherited from my dad. It was like, I don't fix vacuum cleaners and things, but 
my dad will buy, he'll, he'll like buy a shotgun and shitty so that he can figure out how to make it work. And you know, he'll buy something that's not good on purpose. I mean, he's, he likes to work and fix on things. So, so I was raised with that sort of mentality of um, fixing things yourself and, and doing it for yourself. And the other assumption that I, I was raised is like, uh, as far as it comes to being an artist is that you grow up and then you get a job and you work for somebody. And that was sort of the, the drumbeat into my brain as a, as a kid growing up. And as I've mentioned in some other streams, I basically, as my pursuit of being an artist was, the idea was that I had to find a place I could get employment and become an artist and, and work as an artist, getting a, getting a paycheck. So that's the way I pursued things. It never even occurred to me that you could make art and sell it on your own. In fact, it seemed like that was the least viable option is becoming an artist is just making your art. And it, and it went against kind of my understanding of the way the world works. And I think that's a, maybe a, a good assumption that a, a big portion of people in the U.S., maybe around the world, I don't know, I'm just speaking from my, my experience, and uh, is that you work for someone else. And so when I started selling my art as art, I, I was still doing it in, until I could get a real job. So when I was selling it in Venice Beach, when I, for a long time I was just doing that as sort of a placeholder until I could get a real job working for Disney or DreamWorks or, you know, one of those animation studios. I was wanting to get into background painting for feature animation. And, um, anyway, so the funny thing is, is like, so I becoming a artist as somebody who just sells their art was sort of, I just dumb lucked my way into it to some degree. <clears throat> and, um, it wasn't long before I realized that you know, like working for the, by the hour didn't make any sense at all. You know, I, I, it, my income wasn't really dependent by how many hours I put it on. It was just by how much art I could sell at any given venue. And that could that had nothing to do with how much time I was out there. There was times I would make as much money in a whole day in one hour. And sometimes I would be out there all day and hardly make anything. So it didn't have anything to do with the amount of time that I put into it. Um, what, what I started to realize was that the amount of time I put into making paintings and produce, producing new, new product, new inventory, that's where I started getting an increase in sales and increase in income. So it was directly related to my output and the quality of my output. It had nothing to do with how much time I put into something. I mean, I had images that I sold prints of in Venice Beach that were basically a sketchbook drawing I drew while I was out on Venice Beach. I spent maybe 30 minutes on it, or 40 minutes, and I sold prints, $10 prints of it for years and I made thousands of dollars off selling prints that I, of, of an image I spent 30 minutes making. So. I started to realize that jobs are kind of a scam <laughs> um, if you're making stuff because what you're doing is you're creating all this value and if you're trading it for the out by the hour that you're working that whatever value you're creating is worth way more than what you're being paid you know even if you're working you know in the animation industry it's like I I just quit looking for jobs after I kind of figured that out. It's like I figured that you know working I was never going to work by for the by the hour an hourly wage again. Um, and this went against everything that I understood about the way uh, things work. Um, you know I think like most people in the U.S. I was raised in a, you know we were taught specific things. We were taught how to read. We we're taught how to do math and 
taught basic science stuff and a lot of this stuff is really geared to make us um productive like you know if you're learning math so you can calculate measurements and make and build stuff maybe maybe a carpenter you know people use math plus engineers and all, all these things that we're we're creating a way a way for our society to have people that are productive and useful and benefit our society in the forms of whatever various jobs they are and, and luckily we can kind of pick which jobs we want to pursue with our, with our you know with our ambitions or dreams but there's a strong disfavor for certain things <laughs> um oddly like so like a lot of school districts and and cut back their education programs for uh for the arts programs because <laughs> generally i think artists are viewed as not being a very productive element of society uh, which is a weird assumption for people for for society to make but it doesn't tend to equate you know people pursuing artists aren't uh on an assembly line or an amazon warehouse you know fulfilling orders so what they what our education system does is it sort of gears your frame of mind to um be a worker be a worker bee in a lot of ways the you know studying really hard and getting a you know there's, there's, there's a weird misnomer like i see this sort of sort of trope sometimes where somebody will be talking about somebody who went into a hundred thousand dollars worth of debt for a liberal arts degree and now they're struggling and i don't it's always it's always like first of all liberal arts is not a you know or fine arts isn't something worth pursuing the second of all it it kind of dismisses the fact that there are people with lots of really valuable degrees uh that have lots of been saddled with lots of student loan debt including uh people I know like who are, have a master's degree in biology and neuroscience and have so much student loan debt that even with a really good paying job they can barely afford a one bedroom apartment so and if they develop something that becomes very useful and their company makes a billion dollars off of it they get nothing they get <laughs> you know their salary so they don't have any stake in what they're producing there are any stake in it or any ownership in it so like being an artist if that's what you're pursuing is a great way to kind of get around that little trap or caveat in a sense that um when you're producing your work and you're not an employee for someone you're the owner and author of all the work and that's where the real value for your art is is in the exclusivity that's provided to you by the copyrights that are observed you know through the US and other, it's a lot of its allies around the world um, China really observes copyright I've found them plenty of times trying to sell knockoffs on eBay and various places but anyway all right I need to Figure out what I'm doing with this thing. All right, I'm just going to start getting into it. Sorry for all the rambling while I get set up here. I should have had this all prepped. Like I said, I've been rearranging my studios. I clear out stuff. So I had been living in my workspace, which is pretty convenient. I have a decent sized studio, but I was getting tired of living in it. So I have vacated my living situation out of here. And now I have. All this just for working, and it's actually pretty nice. I feel more focused. It's, it's, yeah, it's really good. So back to where, where are we? Um, yeah. So escaping the, the the rat race of working for other people and making stuff that make other people lots of money. Um, I that's that started to occur to me as more and more of um. Like, why would you do that if you 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 know couldn't? I was like, it's. I get it like if you're working you know you want to be a scientist you can't just necessarily go out and be a rogue scientist but you know in the context of being an artist i think you're better off pursuing your 
um, own thing. And um, so back to the basic assumptions part. Um, one of the things, so one of the things that, you know, was pushing against me was this idea that I had to get a job. So that was, that was something I didn't occur to me that there was even an option that you could do something else. It was just like, well, maybe I was aware that people did it, but it's like, that's other people. It's mostly a fantasy. And I didn't know anybody who was really doing anything, um, su successful with the, with art and just make you know anybody well i guess there were if you consider like some of the professors at my college were uh doing fine art but they were also teaching to help with maybe insurance and other things and just to help fill the instability of uh that's inherent in and in, in being a freelance artist of some sort so the the other side of being an artist is you can you know do commercial work and illustration so that was that was the other idea however as i got out of school i was discovering that the the pay and the and the rights that the pay that was being offered and the rights that companies were re requiring of ownership of the work was basically turning everybody into an employee again where they got the luxury of working from home but they didn't get they didn't didn't retain any ownership of their work or very limited ownerships, which means they were limited on how they could sell and resell it. Um, and with a bunch of art schools around the country pumping out a bunch of new students that were really talented, and even people that had been around for a while were competing with people who were willing to do almost anything for nothing. Um, and artists aren't able to create a union of any sort to sort of um, negotiate prices without becoming an employee, without giving up the rights to their work. So there was a real caveat, that, a real kind of pain in the ass there for people, I guess. I'm going to see if I can adjust my camera a bit. So you guys can see what I'm doing a little bit better. Let's try that. All right. <clears throat> so the, the so that that was this the thing I wasn't aware of, of of that was a possibility that I could just do my own thing, and once I became aware of it by stumbling into it, I'm like, I, there's no way. Well, I guess never say never, right? But the idea of um, working at a job was just ridiculous. Like you, you're never going to get anywhere if you're, all your time is being consumed at a job and you're pegged to a per hour. It's like you can't, you can't get ahead of that. While everything keeps getting expensive, your pay is just fixed and finite and there's only so many hours you can work. And so if you're pursuing something that requires an amount of time to work on a painting or, or, or on anything, then... You're, you're stuck. So I, like, I don't, when I'm pricing my work, this is, you know, for the artists out there, I don't necessarily consider how much time I put into something. Uh, mainly because that doesn't really have, like, the amount of time I might put in this painting isn't really as relevant as the quality of the painting itself and the demand that people have for purchasing the work and that sort of thing. So, which is weird because one of the common questions I get or have received is like, how much, you know, how long does it take you to make a painting? And I, and I really don't know how to answer that question real well because there's, first of all, is like, there's the, you know, there's the time of actually standing in front of the easel painting, but then there's time that it takes to develop the idea and all these other sort of things. And then there's the amount of time of experience that I have of making paintings for 25 plus years that go into what I'm doing now. So I wouldn't have been able to make this painting if I didn't have all that experience. So like, you know, so I generally, you know, when I'm talking to other artists and they're asking these questions about 
pricing and how much time and trying to really you're not getting paid for your um, time necessarily as much as you are getting paid for the the vision you have and the way it impacts people emotionally or psychologically or however you want to think about it. I'm trying to figure out how to paint these flames here. Like, I'm just guessing. <laughs> I'm just got to look like light. <clears throat> So, you know, the time you, you know, you might want to take time into consideration if it's taking you an enormous amount of time to make a painting. Like, you don't want to spend a month on a painting and sell it for a hundred bucks. So th there is a, there is sometimes when you can take that in consideration. But when it comes to like, generally, that's not the primary consideration that, that I take anyway. Anyway, where I'm getting away from my subject here yeah so the thing I think that worked for me um, this idea that you do things yourself came from my family upbringing and in, in the culture I was raised in, in Wyoming you know I was, lived in a little oil field camp and you know my first bicycle we got a frame at this town dump and got wheels and tires and I had a Franken bike. That was my first bicycle as a kid growing up. And um, so the things that we had, we a lot of the things we had, we made ourselves or developed ourselves or, or you know, when the things broke, we fixed them. We didn't just junk stuff and throw it away and go buy new stuff. It was not necessarily because we didn't have the resource, like the financial resources to do it. Although my parents seemed to convince me that we were not very well off because I never got that Diamondback bike I wanted, even though all my friends had it. <laughs> but um, we also lived like 60 miles away from any big town. And by big town, I mean a town with a grocery store or a gas station. So like we couldn't just run to the shop or the store like Home Depot or whatever it was and and um, buy things that we needed you know not even you know like the grocery store there wasn't no running running to the store and to get a gallon of milk it was like 60 miles away so you had to be a little bit resourceful I think um so coming to LA and you know the, you know translate that into my into my uh, art experience um, seeing people selling their work on the boardwalk it you know I, I think if I hadn't had that experience it wouldn't have occurred to me that that's an option setting up on a street and selling your work but you know the mentality I had was <laughs> You do, you know, you do what you got to do. And, you know, I recognize that it wasn't glamorous, but it, I, I don't know. It's like, I, I, I still have this sort of kind of obliviousness to myself, I think. Even my, my girlfriend said that she first met me, she described me as being immune to my own appearance. Something along the way. <laughs> like, I'm like kind of blissfully, blissfully unaware a lot of times of, um, what I'm doing, which isn't like some sort of virtue, probably cost me more than it's gained me. But, um, yeah, so like, you know, I, I can see now as like, like now my mentality is like that would like selling in the street wouldn't occur to me as an option now. Um, but that's only because I've, I'm in a different place in my life right now. So like, you know, when I tell people to, you know, that's an option, they 
will often argue with me that they can't do that because such and such and such or whatever idea, you know, like, and all the while they're complaining about, you know, how it's unfair and you have to be with the in crowd to do it. And it's like, it's not true. You just have to be willing to do the things that other people aren't willing to do. And a lot of times that's where the opportunities are. They're hidden in these little um, places nobody else is looking because it doesn't look like anything's there. But I didn't do it because um, I thought it was a great idea. I did it because that was what I had available within my means. Like I didn't have any money or resources or connections or fr you know people that I, I I didn't have anywhere else to turn, and that was that was some place to sell my art possibly. And I figured if I could make that that work there, you know, at least make a couple of bucks. At least I'd still be, you know, that first idea was just that it was supplementing my income with Macy's at the time, and. I needed, I needed every little dime I could get. And then it superseded the income I was making at a job. And then the, I ended up quitting the job because they wouldn't give me weekends off. Yeah, I remember working at Macy's for holiday help back in like 1998. And when I got hired, they were like, well, you're going to be folding shirts and... Unfortunately, we can only afford to pay you six seventy five an hour right now. Like, that's that's our that's our offer. Like, and that and it wasn't even full time work. But I had been looking for work at that point for a month or so, and I hadn't been able to find anything, so I took it. And so I remember, we you know, working a holiday season in retail was just really kind of growing. Like. Folding shirts itself is just kind of like not very fun. And then it's just tedious because you fold a whole bunch of shirts and jeans and then one second later they're just ripped apart and on the floor and <laughs> torn, you know, just ransacked by people looking, you know, shopping. And then, then you got to go back and redo the whole thing over again. But anyway, so I remember being there on a weekend and on a Sunday night, you know, I'd be there till closing, and at the end of the day, some main manager of the store would get on and, you know, thank us and say how good a job we've been doing and congratulate us and that we did, like, the store did, like, $450,000 of sales that day. <laughs> and I'm like, wait a second. There's no room in there for more pay than six seventy five an hour? And, like... I, I can't pay my rent. <laughs> um, so, you know, if Macy's had paid $10, $12, $15 an hour and had benefits, I don't know that I would have quit my job to go sell my art in the street. Because jobs would make sense. You know, you're paid a living wage. You would do probably stupid work that nobody wants to do. And if you have one of those jobs, I'm not saying that it, you know, stupid, and you're stupid for doing it. Uh, it's, it's, I understand. I have worked those jobs. It's the only option you have. That's what you got to do. But I think anybody that works those jobs understands it. It's just kind of a ripoff. And the funny thing is, is that a lot of people that I was working with were indebted to Macy's because when you work there, you got a Macy's card that gave you like a 10% employee discount. And a lot of them would buy a lot of clothes to work there and other things. And then they would end up owing on this credit card and a lot of their paycheck would go right to pay off Macy's credit card. <laughs> Funny times. Let's see here. Yeah, so I mean, so that experience of just watching Macy's rake in million a million dollars in a weekend, and and then you know with uh, a sorrow humble, I'm sorry, say I can't pay you anymore, but then 
congratulate us and then want us to come in and do inventory and bring in donuts and have meetings where they all clap hands and seeing, you know, like get really excited about it's like, <laughs> no. The, the other thing too, <laughs> while I'm on this Macy's rant, uh, it, the Christmas holiday party came up, the company party, and everybody's getting excited about it. It was like, you know, there's going to be prizes, a big dinner, and it was only $15 to go to the party. And I was, my, you know, I was fully sure there was several working there, including my manager at the time. I said, $15? I mean, I have to work two hours just to go to my company Christmas party, and they can't even, you know, afford to give me that. And I don't think anybody else had really occurred to them that they didn't really calculate how much, you know, the, like, that you tend to forget you're getting paid by the hour and you hear $15 and you're like, oh, but I could win a free comforter at the party. So Macy's not only wouldn't pay anything, they wouldn't even give you a Christmas dinner party. You had to pay for that too. And that came out of your pocket. I Yeah. Anyway, so <laughs> I guess that kind of files falls under my jobs are a scam uh, mentality. Uh, so that combined when, with when I would go to Venice on a weekend selling my art and make as much money as I was making at Macy's all week. And they had absolutely, not only would they not pay and give me full-time hours, they had absolutely no flexibility. They wouldn't give me the time off to have another job or to pursue other things. Like, like, I don't know what they were expecting. That's why those, I don't know, maybe maybe they've changed their ways. But it's partly why, you know, I've seen companies that have really high turnover. It's because they, they don't really incentivize the people that are working with for them very well. Like, first of all, the people that can do better will just move on. People that have skill at something, they'll find somewhere else to do it that pays better. But, you know, I don't know. I don't know where I'm going with all this. So, I, I guess a lot of this is to say that the, the, these assumptions we have about the way our society works. So like, when I was talking about how our school trains us to, you know, to read and write and pledge allegiance to the flag and science and history, and we kind of just kind of, we, we get caught up to speed on the game that's going on that everybody's playing in the in, the, in whatever culture you're raised in the, the in the u.s the one thing that they never really teach you anything about is money they don't teach you how to make it what to do with it how it works uh you're on your own with that one and i think that's probably one of the biggest disservices our education system does it doesn't even Teaches you. I remember the, the things I learned in school, and you know, like kindergarten through twelfth grade school was how to balance a checkbook and how to fill out an easy ten forty, and that's all. That's all we got. Um, they didn't teach us anything about business. You know how businesses are structured, how jobs work. Not even in art school, they don't teach you jack shit about any of that. And so I, I come out and it's like I don't have any I as like the it's like it's, things aren't really stacked against you in a sense like they're conspiracy like a, a conspiracy they're stacked against you and just that your own ignorance and the lack of understanding and that like how how could you have any knowledge of what you're supposed to be doing when even the people who are teaching you I don't think even know And I don't know why that is, but it's what occurs to me is like, we don't learn anything about money or business as sort of a part of our primary education. And that is the thing that really, what everybody is trying to do is trying to make money and trying to manage your business. And we don't get any idea of what we're supposed to do with that in primary educations. I think it would be a huge benefit if it were different. And everything I've learned about it is just through the school of hard knocks, basically. 
uh, with the education of watching Glen Gary, Glen Ross, and trying to develop a sales strategy based on that premise. Which works to a certain degree, I suppose. But, you know, I wish I would have known a lot more when I was younger before I wasted a bunch of energy and money on doing the wrong things and not really understand even the basic way you think about money or business is inherently flawed. And the, and the inherent flaw that I think we have is that hard work meet, you know, like hard work on its own is all it takes. And or talent is, you know, you know, as long as you're talented at something, it's, 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 there's some of that is involved, but most of it is <laughs> really basic fundamental things that we don't even have a clue about. Um, just by virtue of the way uh, we're raised in our um, society here. Uh, let's see, let me... I think I'm going to be moving off the frame. Let me change my setup again. Let's get that down. There we go. Looks good. You know, if I were to do anything differently now, it'd probably be to go to some sort of business school and learn learn how businesses get better at how businesses are structured. That would be my advice to artists: is learn everything you can about how to operate and run your own business, because that's what you're getting into. And you know, some I think some of us maybe have grown up in a family. Maybe you grew up in a family that has a family-run business, so it isn't so foreign to you. But if you haven't, then that's one place to start is to understand what it means to run a business, what it means to, um, you know, hire people to do things for you. Kind of brings me to another kind of thought about, like, I've been hearing people complain that, People are not wanting to come back to work because uh, they're getting too much unemployment benefits or some nonsense like that. And I saw this story on the news about this woman somewhere who has a some sort of business in a, like a mall making chocolate chip cookies and stuff. And none of her employees want to come back, so she's been hiring high school students and to do the work and the, the funny thing is is the story was like some sort of like feel good story about how high school students are now able to get a job you know and and the thing that occurred to me is like this woman would hire 10 year olds if she could to avoid having to pay higher wages and if your business can't afford to pay people enough to pay their own rent then maybe you don't have a business that's worth anything You know, if you can't do it yourself and you can't hire someone like to um, pay them well enough that, that they could assist on it or the, or the job doesn't take enough time that they could work several other gigs too, it's like the problem isn't the employees, the problem is the, the business isn't worth anything and nobody wants to work some stupid job just out of the sense of sort of you know earning your keep you know it's like some sort of indentured servitude like I said if I if I had you know, Macy's had paid well and had good but benefits, I might not have done the things I did to get where I'm at. So 
it's kind of a double-edged sword, maybe. But not everybody has a, you know, a specialized skill or, you know, like, you know, whatever resources I had, not everybody has that. So some people need to work jobs because they don't have any other option. And, you know, not sure where I'm going with this here. Let's see. Spinning is kind of fun. Let's see if I can make this go a little bit more. So I, th I think to you know, get off my little soapbox here or whatever I'm on is it takes it might be a good idea to take some time to consider what your assumptions about being an artist are you know this is you know I'm assuming people are watching so mostly people want to pursue being an artist um, you know what is you know what what are the assumptions you have? What are the knowledge sets that you have? I mean, do you already know a whole bunch about running a business? That, that just already gives you an insight that a lot of people don't have. Um, it, 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 so I, at the beginning of the hour, I talked about you're dealt a hand when you're born and you got to play the hand you're dealt. So part of that is understanding exactly what that is. And, you know, I've mentioned before, you want to take the resources and the abilities that you have and employ those things. Um, got to think here. Same time. It's not going well. Let's see here. Sorry, I'm getting lost in this painting and lost my train of thought for a second. Let's add some glowy stuff up here. You know, some of these basic assumptions don't have anything to do so much with, you know, the employment situation and how jobs work it, it can also have to do with the way our culture thinks in general like we we tend to view things in a even though we are in a representative democracy or whatever republic or whatever you want to call it we tend to have a notion of um a dictatorship you know it, uh, in Western thought, I think we tend to think of things as being um, created and governed from the top down, and it kind of lies against the way nature works in a in a sense. Um, n nature tends to delegate authority to things like so. I mean, for example. Um, you can take control of your breathing. You can blink your eyes and move your hands and stuff. But uh, if you stop thinking about it, it takes over on its own. It's the, the authority is delegated and automated. You don't have to be thinking about it all the time to make it operate. Um, and Things tend to, you know, like things, people are, like things grow and, and adapt and change over time. They, they aren't made of things in a, like parts from a warehouse. Like when 
animals and people are born they don't come out of like some sort of like uh factory where they're put together with from parts um they things grow let's see here it's gonna be some sorry i keep on pausing because i'm getting ideas here and so just like the painting the painting that i'm even the one i'm working on it starts as one thing and then it evolves over time into something like I start kind of discovering where things are in the painting and at some point it kind of becomes obvious what where things like need to go what colors need to be used and I don't even really have to think about it too much it just becomes apparent um, in my in my mind anyway And what's weird, so like when you're thinking about making art and the way that schools will teach it is through a lot of technical things like learning how to use materials. And there is some of that there, but ultimately the creation of anything created, you know, doing these things um, is an evolutionary process through just doing it. And as you do it, you find things that work and don't work. And, and so what you'll learn in school is sort of these uh, fundamental principles that you then adapt for your the way you think. And it's weird. Some of the things I was taught at school, I didn't really understand until 15, 20 years later when I figured out how to actually employ it. And I don't know if that's because I just wasn't paying attention. But for some reason, it... it it didn't really click with me a lot of the things I was learning. And now it's just, you know, sort of second nature. Like, oh, yeah, that's fairly obvious to me now. Even though somebody at the time was explaining it to me very bluntly and straightforward, I, I couldn't conceive it because I, I didn't know how to employ it very well. And uh, so the, that's the difficulty of learning anything is that you can watch all the YouTube videos you want, but you're never going to learn how to do something until you just take a crack at it. And it takes some discovery. And some of that is going to require you to quit trying so hard to make it work. You have to risk doing things you don't want to do or doing things you wouldn't think of doing. Risk making mistakes so that you'll stumble into things that work. And so that's how I work on my paintings. That's how I figured out how to make a living as an artist was by actually doing it. And what I did worked for me at the time, and now times are different. So every, you know, any advice that you're going to get from somebody is most likely not going to be relevant to you too much outside of these fundamental principles, um, which I think we're all trying to figure out what those are still. You know, for me, um, the, the basic principle is to, you know, be making the art. As far as the business is concerned, like the, the, it all boils down to um, doing doing that thing, making making it. Um, And you can't sit around waiting for inspiration either. Uh, if, you, 
feel like you're blocked, you don't know what to do, it's like really what you got to do is just sit down and get started. Because it's usually when you're in the middle of something that the ideas start flowing and something strikes. Like you're not going to think your way through it. You have to kind of take some action. Look like it's on fire. <laughs> Oh, I'm way off the screen, aren't I? You know, the other thing I've been thinking about lately too is like, I look back at where I where I started and it seems so far away now that it almost seems like it's a dream. Kind of weird. You know, I was pushing up on 20 years since I first started doing this. And I, I see where I'm at now and I, I, even though I was there the whole time, it's like hard to really pinpoint like, how I got from there to where I'm at. And then I look at where I'm at and I'm still trying to figure out and navigate um, what's next. Um, the, the pressure is always there. You know, it's different, but there is, there is no sort of, um, place where you get and you feel like you've made it there's always it's like you get to the top of one ladder and there's you're just at the base of another one uh, there is no real making it or a place where you feel like I did it there's I think there's probably um moments of that where you feel like oh man look at this and and then it becomes just like everything else that you, you work hard, you do things, and things work, and things don't work, and surprises come up and knock you down. And you it's it's a constant you know it's a constant battle. So if you're going through that, don't be discouraged, and. Um, any more than you have to be. Okay, everybody goes through that. And everybody continues to go through it, uh, whatever level they're at. It's like even in my, so I, I mentioned before that I've trained Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. And as I've gone up in the ranks, the higher up in the ranks I go, it feels like I don't know what I'm doing. And it's weird because I train against people who are lower rank and they seem to think they know what they're doing and I handle them. 
um, but I still feel like I don't know how I'm doing it. You know, it's kind of like, I mean, I, I do in a lot, a lot of sense. Like I, I, it's like the way I feel and the, what, what is the reality is two different things. So like it, feeling like you knowing what you're doing and then doing something that's competent, it's kind of two different things. And so some of the way I let go of that is I, I don't, tr I don't try to achieve, like I, like, I mean, I, tr I put effort into things, but like when I'm training, it's like, if I don't fight and I don't try to win and I loosen up and I allow myself to get into gnarly positions, I discover that I, I learn how to get out of those positions and work through them learn to get comfortable being very uncomfortable. Um, and learning how to handle, you know, how to not, like jujitsu for me is learning how to not fight and not really learning how to not fight yourself. Because when you're struggling against your partner, your opponent, or the project you're working on, you're really forcing you're really fighting yourself because you're trying to force something into a, and it, force something to happen and you're struggling and you're wasting energy when if you can take the time be patient sometimes things just work themselves out first of all a lot of the problems a lot of this a lot of the um prob, you know things we have to solve they don't need you to be intervening in things um And then if you're patient, a lot of times the solution becomes apparent with something that happens around something else around you changes. Like I'll be working on this painting and I'll stumble into something that's working with the color decisions or whatever. I'll be training and just I'll be I'll stumble into a into a um, transition or into a sweep and that comes from a place somebody doesn't expect using their own momentum. And so you start to learn how to utilize the things that are going around you to your benefit rather than having to force things into submission, into working properly. Um, taking the t taking time, like, I'll take more time, a lot of time just to stare at my painting trying to figure out what to do with it rather than just realizing something's not working and then trying to, you know, strong arm the painting into into cooperating and a lot of times when you do that you can end up making things worse rather than just taking the time to observe what the painting is and then figuring out where the issue is and then it might be something very small or minor that needs a minor tweak and that's what solves it rather than spending an hour of painting over things and changing things and rearranging it only to find that you didn't you have to go back and do it again because you screwed it up or that you had it was better before you went in trying to ham fist it or whatever <laughs> like a better word so all right well that's about an hour and i think i'm going to look up some references of flames and just see if I can make that start working a little bit better as I work on it next. So I might start doing more of these live streams throughout the week, but I'm going to be doing those. I have a, a Patreon set up for people who want to see things like this firsthand. I'll be doing these things on Friday on YouTube and Facebook. Um, but I'll probably do some more live streams throughout the week for people who want to like follow along what I'm doing. And that way I'm not blowing up my Facebook page with a bunch of live streams that nobody cares about. Cause like I said, the most of this is, just, I think is starting to fall in line with uh, other artists might be viewing this and, you know, 
trying to reach out to people that are coming up. Like, I know how hard it was when I was doing it. And uh, trying to be a resource to those people. And on the Patreon, I think right now, I don't really have too much set up there. I think it's like, I don't think it charges anything to just pay attention to it. Uh, I think there's like, like a dollar, like for a dollar you can get first view of things, but I, I don't even remember how I have it set up, but I, I do remember that you don't have to pay anything. But if you want to go over there and check it out, see other posts, because I, I kind of want to move over there as well to get away from some of the other social media, because social media is just, um, it's kind of like chasing, chasing a car. It's kind of like, you know, like holding a, a treat above a dog and making him jump for it, but every time you, he jumps, the, 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 the treat gets raised up higher, and eventually you just realize you're, you're never going to get that treat. <laughs> so, like, anyways, I feel like social media is, you know, when I post stuff, it's not going out to the people that are subscribed to it, so I want to find a place that people who really want to follow what the process of making these paintings are can follow me there, and I'll slowly be working that up as I move along. If you guys have any questions... Uh, comments, please feel free to post them, and I will catch up with you later.